Nick. Unsuccessfully. We'll get back to the. We'll kick it to you right now. Okay. What's your topic? My topic, of course, comes from our amazing community of best friends. Uh, if you have a topic for the show, please tweet at Nick underscore Scarpino your topic. Follow me on Twitter. Uh, that's where all the topics come, and I will pick one at random or one that I feel is not random that I want to talk about. Like. Or I'll just do whatever the fuck I at want. At Ryan underscore Dinsdale. Dinsdale. Way to go on the underscore. Mr. Dinsdale. Repping the underscore. Real, real men have underscores. <laughs> uh, who says, if you could absorb the knowledge of any human that ever existed, who would it be and why? Isaac why? Newton. Why? You have to answer why. You're going to die like scurvy or hepatitis or something stupid. Good job. I'm just so up on this Cosmos episode where Wait, he's like a genius among geniuses. Wasn't Newton like an like a, a, a introvert, though? Didn't he have like no friends? In the I think he was a little... Quick. So we're, we need, this is as usual, I have a million questions about this. Okay. Yeah. Let's, so let's I, define the terms. Here. I'm sucking the knowledge, but I'm keeping myself, yeah, I'm you're still yourself. me, mm-hmm. I just get everything this person knew, Yep. and I can look through their memories and stuff? Yeah, you know everything, all the little twisted dark secrets, okay. everything they know about sex and life and eating and okay. what's a sandwich oh, and what's not ooh, a sandwich. Okay, everything now I'm going to have to change eating. my answer. If it's, not, if it's perspective and not just information. Then I may have to change my answer. It's anything. It's knowledge. Knowledge. Right. Knowledge is more than just you know. Well, right. Hard when you said facts. knowledge, yeah, I thought facts, information. Yeah, but knowledge gotcha. and one can be knowledgeable about any subject. Knowledge was be. their treasure. Totally. Jesus. They gave us a crystal skull. Let me I go, Indy. This is what I want. That movie ruined my mood for months. Why would you do that? That movie just soured. I don't even want to talk about it. I hate that movie. Let's not talk about it. It was <laughs> arguably the second best in the series. I just want you to know that. The second. Best? <laughs> oh, Jesus. right behind I'm Young kidding. Indiana Jones. I'm the joking. book I read. Uh, I would, I would go, I would stay in science. I would go with Einstein. The reason I would go with Einstein is because he knew everything Isaac Newton knew already. Like that's why you don't Ooh. want. That's why you don't want to go back too far because, like, you could say something like, "Well, I'd want to be a smart." We talked about this like Aristotle and, and Socrates, but they were wrong about so much. Like, even though they were smart, like they actually didn't know anything. Mm-hmm. They were you really know? good so, at like, making it sound like they were super. Well, smart. they they made it. They observed the world around them and tried to figure things out based on what they knew, but they actually didn't know as much as they thought they did. And the everyone world. built on everyone built on their knowledge to get to the point where we were. Right. We have atomic energy now, or something like that. So, right. wouldn't you want to like get with someone contemporary? You know that. Would, well, so, that would so is the, right, the answer Stephen Hawking then? Just yeah, yeah. Well, my argument is for like you guys. The, I'm, I'm thinking about the the power of knowledge that Isaac Newton had, at least as best as I can understand it, dwarfs that of any modern scientist. Maybe save Einstein, because it's it's that knowledge that allowed him to invent things like calculus. Like the the example that they used in Cosmos was that before Isaac Newton, the math didn't exist to explain why the uh, orbits of the planets were elliptical and not circular when in theory in all theory they should be circular and so to figure that out he had to do something that nothing that no one had ever done before and it was because of his immense knowledge that he was able to do that and now explain it i would venture i guess that someone like that even 200 years in the future would be able to take the information and knowledge uh, basis at their hands and be of great use, regardless of what yeah, time so, I mean, they, This guy's in. an extreme intellect, right? So no yeah. matter what, he would go and Vast look at it. intelligence. By the yeah. time he was in high school, he would have figured out and learned everything that he needed to know about calculus, trigonometry, totally. algebra, any, any, of the, any of the maths. Mm-hmm. The mathematics. The, the mathematics. The romance languages, they call it. Um, and yeah, so he, the guy could extrapolate whatever he wanted to, right? I mean, mm-hmm. you're talking about a genius level intellect here. Let's, mm-hmm. let's, let's make no bones about it. He's like a Professor X. Yeah, like... He is, I think it, to, oh, to use so a different hard. example, like if you were to use, if it were Mozart Mango. was such a master musician and a genius, just because he never played guitar doesn't mean he couldn't be a great guitarist, right? Like sure. that's the way I look at it. But you are right, like especially in the sciences, which have come so far in such a short time, it may be more prudent to be to choose someone. Uh, I guess a little bit more contemporary. Yeah, I mean, it's just like I look at it as like a, a really drastic slope, like. It was like science and understanding was like very flat until the Renaissance, and which point now it's just like gone like way, 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 way up. You know, like in the last three or four hundred years, where it's mm-hmm. <clears throat> absurd. So yeah, I would I would want to pick someone at the peak that was really smart, just because they wouldn't have to worry about the semantics of not understanding the contemporary science. But you're right. I mean, like I, you know, Isaac Newton is considered like one of the great geniuses of all time. I mean, if we were talking about philosophy and and all that kind of stuff, I think Thomas Jefferson would be a really interesting dude too. But you know, he or Benjamin Franklin, like dudes that were just like gentlemen scholars, gentlemen scientists, um, that like did a lot of different things, like that were interested in a lot of things. So I could, not that I consider myself Jefferson or Franklin, but I, I'm really inspired. I was really inspired by them as a kid to like want to like learn everything. I want to know a little bit about botany. I want to know a little bit about how much philosophy. You know about botany? I know quite a bit about botany. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I, 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 I think I've said this to you before. Like, 
when I went to college, I always knew I was going to major in history. I figured I was going to major in history when yeah. I was like six years old. Uh, I was like obsessed with history when I was a young kid. And but there was I was always pulled in towards science, and I actually wanted to major in physics for a while and and and, and astronomy until I realized when I was a little older until I realized that I just could not do the math. Like it was not too even, hard. It was not even yeah. worth it. And one of the things that I wanted to do if, in, in science was I wanted to be, go go into botany. Like there was like I there was like a I wanted to do history and archaeology. Um, archaeology wasn't practical Indiana for Indiana Jones. For, yeah, that's why I wanted to be an archaeologist when I was. A um, kid. I just like love. I just like I. So I went to Jamestown when I was a kid. There's a, a, a really embryonic um, American archaeology movement now that things are getting old enough. Yeah, and a lot of it has to do with like Native Americans and. And old settlements and stuff like that. And I was like, that's cool. And I went to Jamestown. I got really inspired by it. But I, again, I was like, too much science. Because um, you have to you have to take like geology and stuff like that. The the which is fine. That's fun. All this is fun. I love it all. Rocks are boring. I think that rocks I think, are boring. <laughs> I think all uh, the Some most the over most here. boring. The only <laughs> science to me that I really didn't take to and like was biology. Like I really liked. Also boring. I, I loved chemistry. I loved like earth sciences. Like and I loved you know so botany and all those kinds of things. I really enjoyed too, even though it's very biological. And I loved chemistry. And chemistry was probably the one I understood the best. But when I really got into physics, like I took an astronomy class in college that I thought was astronomy and it ended up being it was but it was astrophysics like <laughs> like one eleven or something. Wow. Like that. It was taught by a dude. Uh, I think his name was Michael Swain, um, and he works at CERN in Europe in Switzerland. Mm. And he Snap. would nap. And he would fly to Boston to teach a few classes and then fly back every week. And uh, so I don't know like how much they were paying this guy. He was a really friendly dude, really nice guy, but that class was so hard. And that, so that, that taught me like, I can't even do the intro freshman level thing. Yeah. Like, yeah. So, and, and at, at that point I knew I, I didn't want to do it anyway, but I, I, I didn't have the aptitude, the scientific left brained aptitude. I think it's left brain to, to really deal with it. I'm a humanities guy. I'm a writer. And like I'm more abstract, so that that even though I was, so I was always interested in botany and those kinds of things, but I I understood at an early age that I don't think I had the acumen to do it to hack it. Like it's hard. Like I know guys that are math. I, I knew a math ma- I, I knew a math major, like someone who majored in math in college, which I didn't even know was possible. <clears throat> like I knew I knew you could allowed. do it, but like, oh, like yeah. she, and she was smart as shit. Yeah, my you know, cousin like, uh, is the same thing. She majored in applied mathematics at Berkeley, and it's like. Like that's, I, that's next level shit. I man. looked at I looked at a lot of her homework back in the day, and uh, there's so there's not even numbers on the page. I don't even I don't get it. Like it's a bunch of symbols. Yeah, it's all these symbols cosine, and equations that I have no idea what I'm looking at. And a bunch of math with sine, sine cosine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, uh, Kevin just wanted to interject with a fun fact that he said. Uh, fun fact: Calculus was also created by Leibniz at the exact same time. I refuse to accept this fact. I will substitute my own reality. So it was invented by Newton. He basically is Newton. telling you that you're a big fat bold liar. Or maybe it was jo- maybe it was John Swain. Tell it to Neil deGrasse Tyson. Three man. Colin Moriarty. I'm trying. I'm trying mm. to find this guy. I haven't. I haven't thought about him in a while. I, I remember seeing him. This particular professor. I didn't realize how prolific he was. He was actually a really modest dude, um, which is which is great. But I remember seeing him on the Discovery Channel like a few years after I had him. I was like, oh. that's crazy. Uh, well, if you're working at CERN, you're the real deal. You're right. Is that the big building that has a particle collider? That's the yeah. large Hadron. Yeah, here he is, John yeah. Swain, Northeastern University. Yeah, he worked at the uh, LEP Accelerator in CERN. Look up Dr. Virgil Swan. Yeah, that's him. That's funny. There he is. <laughs> Who is that? Look him up. L3 at the LEP Accelerator in CERN, Geneva, Switzerland, the I'll large electron... Pro- hey, you're not funny. You positron think. Collider. Some people think I'm funny. Maybe next time you won't slam a guy with a plasma. Very interesting. Yeah, he, was, he, just, he was a fascinating dude. Just a couple weeks ago, Nick was like, what does the Large Hadron Collider do when we were walking to lunch? And I was like, Nick... <laughs> Come on. <laughs> it's looking for the God particle, isn't it? Yeah, it found it. Yeah, the God particle, it found it. Oh, oh. my God. And you now were, all the scientists are trying to fight that. <laughs> it would have been funnier if they, they did. They don't want to call it the God particle. Yeah. Uh, I would I would want to know the knowledge of Sean Connery. <laughs> Wise <Always>. choice. <laughs> he seems like he's in, he's an interesting fellow. He's going to have... He, I could be a really good actor with that, that knowledge. Yeah. I would get to live vicariously through him. I'm sure he's had some experiences. I was going to say earlier that it would be worth choosing someone from the arts yeah. because as as filmmakers, mm-hmm. it's more, I guess, important to know perspective and uh, I guess emotional intelligence than it is just like knowledge. Right. So who would you choose from the arts? I would have to take a really long... I'd are, are, think about it a lot. I mean, what about Sean you Connery. What are you talking about? It's done. Connery's an excellent Think about choice. that. I'd be an 31 and have, have I'd have the chops of Sean Connery. I'd know how to act that way, how to do all the cool things. I, so my was accent it, it wasn't would only get like, better. The only thing that I would say Oh, about, it's me, Sean Connery, ain't it, Gavna? <laughs> pop, pop, 009. <laughs> <laughs> pop, pop, 009. You, are, you, sir, are a disgrace. <laughs> you are a disgrace to the Bond franchise. I want you to leave this room right now. Don't, don't leave. You have to outro Oi. us. 
Question. What's the Q? <laughs> <laughs> oh, give me that watch and spit the fireballs with you. <laughs> Save the queen. Save the country. Just let it, when he's like this, there's no stopping. Just but I'm him, just saying, like, think about that. If I could, I'm thinking about it. That's yeah, but the, the problem with the problem with uh, Sean Connery, old Sean Connery, is that you don't have his. No, this is no offense to you. You're a, a, an Adonis of a human being, but you don't have his looks. And Sean Connery started as a model. That's why he was picked. Attitude but, is everything, man. You just need his his swagger, his like his confidence. His chest doesn't. But what hurt I? But either. am I getting that? What? Am I getting his confidence? I mean, I'm learning. You're pretty I, confident, though. I'm. I know. Imagine the Sean Connery level confidence. You'd be unstoppable. Maybe I already have it. I don't even know. But I don't. I don't think I'm taking on his like. You know, what I mean, like it's not like I'm gonna. He's gonna have some workout tip in there. No, but the knowledge. Sean Connery's guy to not being fat. Don't eat as much and exercise. Like it's not. Well, I'm not gonna be like. Oh. No, but the knowledge of like how to best use confidence. I think that's something you learn as you mm. like. You either you. I mean, I guess it's not you either are confident or you aren't because there are plenty of people who aren't who become confident or you learn to use it. But that's a guy who famously was, you know, always very self-assured, like walked around with a swagger, knew what he was doing. And I think that's part of discovering that, like, that's learning, sure, that's sure. knowledge. Yeah. Plus, you have good stories. Drinking with people, being with the ladies. Being in, like, a ton of Bond films didn't hurt. I wouldn't even think of those. Those memories would never be accessed. But you don't think Isaac Newton didn't have good stories? Remember that time no, he I got hit in the, with the apple? <laughs> it's like, hey, I'm going to discover I'm sitting under this tree. I'm, wear, I'm wearing this powder wig, everybody. Check out this awesome prism that I made. I made this prism. These clothes sure are hot. Nobody will invent better ones for 50 years, though. <laughs> I've had the same wig for 15 years. It's weird uh, that he's got a kind of, hey. he's got, he's got actually like a new, like a Brooklyn native and and Mike and uh, and walking. In a, in a hundred years, somebody's going to like that Spider-Man. <laughs> they mess with one of them. They mess with all of them. It's, it's a well-known fact that uh, Sir Isaac Newton was actually a crane operator in uh, <laughs> downtown New York. <laughs> he was in purgatory and got re- and got and was reborn in New York. Yeah, as in Thomas post-war Howell. New York. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. He was also a longshoreman. Uh, if I had to pick two, because Sean got to pick two, so I get to pick two now. One from the I arts. get to pick two? Well, you picked two. Well, you said you're, th- you're thinking about your second one from the arts. Yes. So I'm going to go with one from the arts, one from sciences. The arts, I would go with like a James Cameron. Mm. So if you're going to, you know, if you're talking to filmmakers, here's a guy that knows how to make anything you want to throw at him. He knows how to negotiate Hollywood or mm-hmm. navigate Hollywood. He knows how to make a huge blockbuster. Uh, he knows how to start a career, how to keep a career, an enduring career. And he also knows how to ch- turn his passions for one thing into a career in filmmaking as well so he for instance you know he is just i think if i'm if i remember reading this correctly set a record for the deepest dive like yeah. humans have ever gone to He's, right he holds the record which for the trench deepest, is it which trench? mariana trench mariana. yeah so. that's why i think jim cameron's actually a really good choice because he's one of those guys who actually more than most exists on both levels he's a scientist for yeah he's purposes. yeah he's, he's very much almost. an explorer uh he designed the cameras on the on the on the nasa rovers that are on mars right now like, yeah, but like, think, I mean, think about this guy. That's crazy. Like, you see these pictures of him in this little submarine. It's him in this little submarine. Yeah. And the things like you have to get in because the whole the hole has to be so thick. And like, yeah, I imagine there's a lot of science that goes behind it that I don't understand. But he has to that get was discovered. in. And he is just like everything's right here. And the guy's got stones. I mean, he's going down deeper than anyone's ever yeah. gone down before. You're not going <clears> to <throat> say anything about that? No. Good. Uh, so I'd pick, I'd pick him because I I mean the guy's just had a stunning career and has obviously been able to do a lot of things outside of that. Terminator, Terminator was amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, as was T two, The Abyss, Judgment Day, The Abyss was amazing. Uh, if I went with someone in more of the scientific vein, I'd probably go with Steve Jobs. Mm-hmm. Now there's a guy, and the reason I go with Steve Jobs not because to have his knowledge of I how think to it's make science, it's business. That's what you I'm saying. Making bank. Well, aside from his business acumen, I he is a guy that understands what it's like to change the world and and have a a, uni, a vision that you can rally every single person in your in your company behind and really 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 have like I mean change the world that's what he did the iPhone six times every device that he's put, put out was amazing so I'd want to know like what is your thought process that that liberates you from all these things that weigh us down as normal human beings and and allow you to dream that big and then have the balls to go after it. LSD was it the- LSD uh, he's cited that numerous times. Yeah, you got to you you watch Pirates of Silicon Valley. One of the things he said about uh, about Bill Gates, he was like, Bill Gates will never be a visionary because he's never dropped any acid. Something he said numerous times, Steve Jobs, which is totally kind of... That's twisted. That's jo- Jobs was interesting, though, because he had the trifecta. He was he was, he was uh, an, a computer engineer and a guy who understood science and math, 
but he admitted that he didn't understand like Wozniak did, which is why you know they were great partners at least in the beginning. He was a businessman who saw like we talked about before the Apple one and knew that he shouldn't. They you know Wozniak wanted to give it away, he wanted to sell it, and they created Apple and got in bed with Intel and early on and stuff like that. And then he was an artist and a visionary that's that's understood the aesthetic was really important too. That yeah, and, yeah, that's, well, and that's, that things have to be beautiful. That like simple at least later on that simple was best. But see, and that's what I that's that's the thing to me is like it's so very seldom that you meet a human being that's so good at both of those aspects, Mm -hmm. business and art, you know, uh, threading that line or skating that line between both and finding that one perfect, beautiful product. Well, it was really all three, right? Like he's one of the few figures who very much has operated like right at the center of where art, science and business all kind of intersect. Yeah. Yeah, The Venn diagram. Yeah. It's a Mm -hmm. Venn diagram. If you guys get to, I want to. I'm going to be Ben Franklin as well. I'm going to get his knowledge. You want to get struck by lightning? Oh yeah, by yeah. flying a kite. In ben a Franklin storm? was just, he was a dope ass motherfucker. He was he was one of the most OG motherfuckers there ever was. <laughs> yeah. Like sh- like sh- you, did you see John Adams the HBO? Miniseries? Yeah yeah. Oh my. Was Nolte like, Ben Franklin, or was he Jefferson? Nolte was like no, he was up. Franklin. I think. Was he Franklin? Yeah, because he was no, one like, living. Someone... He lived in Paris for a while. Yeah, yeah. Like... I mean Jefferson was there too, but the the and Adams was there too, but. Um, like I've said it before, I, I love that scene of him in the bathtub with like the, the French aristocrat when they're playing chess, and and he was and he, he like women just apparently loved him like fucking loved he was him. He's a baller, you know, because he was wild. smart and he knew how to talk to people and like he, he was interesting. I gotta see who played him in this. But uh, I love John like hit, hit, that the way they portrayed his character. And, yeah, like, was that's one of the great. By the way, if you've never seen John Adams on HBO, it's on it's Amazon great. Prime. It's I've never seen. It. I'm gonna have to awesome. check it out. Oh, it's so good. It's it's based on uh, McCullough's uh, biography. Um, but it's a narrative, like it's a, it's a scripted show. It's a scripted yeah, yeah. show based oh, it's on a show, based on the book. Film. It starts in 1770 with the Boston Massacre. It goes all the way through 1826. Awesome. Uh, Paul Giamatti, right? Yeah, Paul Adams. Giamatti plays John Adams. Cool. Um, period pieces tend to not be my thing, but I'm oh my good God. one. Good ones I'm down for. It's an immaculate oh, period piece. Tom Wilkinson played ben, Tom Wilkinson. Benjamin Franklin. Yeah, I could see him in my, awesome. in my head. Yeah. Him. Was Nolte in it? No, I don't think he was. Ah, yes. I think, Nolte, sort of... I think Nolte played Benjamin Franklin at some point oh, okay. in his career. There's like, I love, what I love about John Adams is that they really got, there's like everyone, everyone's in that movie. Like Dude, all it's the really a crazy important. cast. Like all, and I don't mean actor wise, I mean like they got like obscure, They like people were playing obscure American history, like characters that were kind of pushed to the side and historicity because of the prominence of like seven or eight of the founders. It was really cool. I love the guy who played Washington in that especially. Because he's he, in everything, he's in the rock. He was he was just awesome because he was just like he pl- he played it. He all the characters were played exactly the way I envisioned them. When you were you know, you, Madison when you were was awkward and, your... and Jefferson was like kind of full of himself and like all this like I I, I envisioned them like that. I think that like they did a really nice. Job. I want to rewatch it. I haven't watched it in forever. Well, supposedly I think it was supposed to go on longer than it did. I think they lost funding for it. But I think it was supposed to be like three or four seasons or something like that. And they, I think they, they I think oh, they, actually no, I'm, I took that back. It was only supposed to be a mini series. It was. I think it was, it was a mini series, but I think they might have tr- like they kind of started rushing towards the end. So I wonder if they actually did was was actually supposed to be longer. They spent like a lot of time in the revolution, rightfully so. Um, Benjamin Franklin, so smart, good writer, great head on his shoulders, understood everything. You drew that. Drew. He's a great artist too, kind of. Good tattoo artist. <laughs> it's not not the best snake I've ever seen, but it, it'll hold up as a snake. It was not drawn. It was engraved into a wood block. So you got to give him some credit. I'll for give that. I'll give him that then. I'm I'm coming back because it was. Supposed to be printed, right? Okay. All right, Colin. Yes. What's your topic? Uh, so a lot on on the show I like to talk about space, I like space, 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 space travel. Um, uh, really interested in science, obviously. The so. final frontier. Space. Um, and uh, oh, Mike, Mike Mitchell's here, so I gotta go out and bring this game to him. Uh, he's gonna fill time. Uh, can time. you give me like a minute? Yeah, sure. We'll, what do I do? we'll shoot the shit. All right. Hey, Sean. Hey, what so, do you want to talk about that you haven't talked about today? Well, I'm still giving. Th- uh, well, I don't know. I was still thinking about who my second choice was going to be if it was going to be from the arts. I was going to say Orson Welles. Oh, that's a good one. He grew up during the like the golden age of Hollywood and the golden mm-hmm. age of American commercialism, like ba- basically when America was at its strongest and at its like best. But what are you going to do with his knowledge? Well, I mean, that dude. And, by the way, Kevin, you let this keep going. That dude is another no break. Dude. <laughs> You don't like this is show. still the last topic. You don't let Kevin do it. Yeah. The, uh, All right, you better know Kevin. I was gonna stop. <sighs> oh, you wait till we get those insults. Out. I don't want. Yeah, you better not be. Throw waiting. one out right now. Just give us one nope. insult. We're waiting. On, none of the insults are coming out yet. On, We're waiting them. till everybody's checks what clear. What is this insult segment that you guys do on Patreon? Uh-huh. Dot com forward slash kind of funny. If you support us, one of the categories that we will refill every month is you get to uh, put an insult into the show via. Portillo. Kevin. 
So if you have a fun Hunter Pence style sign intro or in, intro <laughs> insult, <laughs> oh for one, uh, Kevin will read it on the show and huh. he'll, he'll, he'll shout it at me. It'll, it'll be an insult directed at me. But from it can't off be camera. an insult in the in in you know you're just calling Greg. It's got to be one of the Hunter Pence insults. It's got to be a clever it's be insult funny. that both kind of insults funny. and yeah. boosts Greg's ego. Got it. So you're thinking Orson Welles. I'm thinking Orson Welles. Uh, the dude is, you know, a master of many different arts. Like long before he was a film director, he directed theater. It was very successful there. When he uh, kind of main- moved into mainstream media, yeah. he uh, started doing radio and is famously the producer and main voice yeah, of War the, of the uh, War of the Worlds, which I guess there's conflicting reports on this, but when people heard the War of the Worlds, War of the Worlds broadcast originally, they thought it was real. Yeah, I don't know it. if that's actually... Accurate. That's what I've heard. I never heard that there was another thing. Yeah, I took a radio and uh, broadcasting class back in college where, like, I guess it, nowadays that fact is kind of blown out of proportion. Oh, really? Like, most people knew it was not real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, But some people did, which is crazy. It was very successful. And then he moved into filmmaking where he arguably made a couple of the best movies ever made, uh, namely Citizen Kane. Yeah. And the one that I think is great, which no one ever talks about, which is Touch of Evil. Now, Touch of Evil, I've said this, I've told Nick about this before. Have either of you seen Touch of Evil? I don't even know what Touch of Evil is. Touch of Evil is this film noir from 1958. And film noir was this movement that existed from 1940 to 1941, essentially, to 1958. And it ended with Citizen Kane, or not Citizen Kane, but Touch of Evil. And it was because Orson Welles made a film noir that was so good and so smart and so what film noir actually was that everyone who was making film noirs was just like, shit. (laughs) Pack it up. We can't do it anymore. And literally no one made another film noir until Blade Runner, which is crazy. Interesting. Yeah. So. Kind of like DC Universe Online. Yeah. Came out. Perfect MMO. Everybody's like, fuck, stop. Oh, geez. Yeah. It was, he's, he had a, he had a very, very intimate and deep knowledge of the art and not just filmmaking, but all arts. Like he is, his perspective and just his, his knowledge about it and what it actually meant was probably greater than any other filmmakers. See, I think, yeah, I mean, I have to default to directors on these just because, like, watching a director at the beginning of his career to where he is now is always such an interesting uh, sort of examination. Seeing where, like, Ridley Scott was, right, where he, where he, when he directed Alien versus where he is, I mean, even at Blade yeah. Runner or, or, oh. or now or with Prometheus and like, just seeing, like, the, the simplicity of sort of where he put the camera, how long the shots lasted, how long the edits were, like, how many edits there were, that versus now, I think part of me is like oh that's an awesome journey to go on as a creator and obviously we do that on a minimal level with what we do here with the show right like Mm -hmm. we iterate and we figure out new ways to do things and stuff like that but there is an allure to wanting to skip ahead and immediately know what that person knows at a 40 year career in filmmaking and going like dude if I could like you see these guys come out of college sometimes you'll see them come out of USC and they'll direct their first movie and you're like how how did you do that oh yeah Maybe you had a great DP, maybe you had great people around you, but also you had a vision that was way more mature than it, than it ought to be for someone who's 23 years old, you know? Well, and that's like kind of my greatest fear as a filmmaker is like, I'll make a movie and I'll put my heart and soul into it and it'll come out a piece of shit. <laughs> and I'm like, Probably well. Probably will. I mean, if you look at early, a lot of early people, that's, that's oh, yeah, what happened, totally. right? Like Kevin Smith will even say, Clerks was a giant piece of shit. There's mm-hmm. no reason why anyone should like that movie, but we all do because mm-hmm. he put heart into it and that's all that matters. Yeah. And that's what the thing about Orson Welles is I guess maybe the counter argument there is he only really made a couple of films. Like everyone, all the other movies he tried to make ended up being like disasters not just because of like some of them most of them we didn't even finish because hollywood and the system were turned against him essentially but system. you know touch of evil like imagine the film at, at the time he made uh touch of evil film noirs were like action movies nowadays like you would get a couple every year there were all over the place everyone was really interested in it if someone were to make an action film now that was so good that everyone, including Michael Bay, was just like, "Wow, I can't, I can't do it anymore." Like, yeah, yeah. that's that's doing something totally different, like super smart and very just dialed into what the art actually can do and what it can be. Um, it was both in a way like self-referential, uh, but also uh, totally sort of absorbing. Like you didn't know that it was being self-referential. It was kind of crazy, super crazy. We're talking about Touch of Evil. You ever seen it? Touch of Evil. It's a film Orson from 1958. Wells flick. Orson Welles. No, I don't think so. Mm. Here's my question for you, and this is going to sound like a joke, Greg Miller joke, but <clears> it's, <throat> it's a Greg Miller serious joke. Mm-hmm. Does it offend you as a filmmaker, someone who's super knowledgeable about the craft, you're referencing Orson Welles, that most people don't, number one, know these films that you're talking about, uh, and number two, only know Orson Welles honestly is like the peas guy? 
<laughs> the YouTube clip of the guy losing his shit and the P's VO read, right? Yeah. You know what I'm talking about, obviously? I do, yes. Yeah. Um, no, it doesn't offend me. I think uh, there was a time when like, I was still coming up through film school where I was very, very pretentious about filmmakers. Mm. Like, all kids are. Like, you know, they, for some reason, they think that their taste is indicative of their own skill, which is sure. totally not how it works at all when it comes to the arts and graphs. Um, I think it just it's it's how culture works, right? Like what is popular doesn't necessarily di- necessarily dictate what is quality. And Orson Welles and people like Akira Kurosawa, another great filmmaker, they all kind of fit into that category. Like they're supreme, they're above like head and shoulders above every other filmmaker. They're masters of the craft, um, but they're not necessarily the popular. Like when it comes down to it, I've come to terms with the fact that Stanley Kubrick's gonna have a little paragraph in the history books whereas steven spielberg will probably have a whole chapter yeah but like i don't know anyone who's actually knowledgeable of, about film who would say that spielberg is more of an artist or was oh, a sure. better filmmaker than kubrick but that's just popularity you know like yeah either for different audiences so that doesn't really offend me and i'm fine with that and plus i like you know the fact that no one you have to kind of dive into that stuff to really know about it you know mm-hmm. and i guess nowadays I can't really fault people for not knowing who Orson Welles was. Like, he's from a different era. You yeah. Know? 